Hey, this is Brie Bagwell, and if you want to listen to this podcast early and ad-free, subscribe to my Patreon at www.patreon.com backslash Brie Bagwell. That's always amazed me, like even someone like Bruce or Dylan. Mm. Dylan, I've seen Dylan a few times, and, you know, not to knock Dylan, but you can't always understand his lyrics anyway, so I think if he messes up, I wouldn't even know. But Bruce, (laughs) I know the, you know, and always amazed me when an artist can remember like, how do you remember so many words to so that just... If you start thinking about it, that's when you mess up. Yeah, I've heard like, that. I've yeah. heard you can't think. You just got to yes. roll. Just yep. go. As soon as you start thinking about it. Hey, hey, everybody. This is Bree Bagwell, and this is my podcast, Only Vans, where I talk to my friends. They love it. Yeah, writers are an interesting thing because you you want what you want, but you also don't want to overdo it. Yeah, and then we love it when like the band Shenandoah they put funny stuff in there, like, like what uh, a purple stuffed zebra, <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> Exile they wanted a picture of uh, Marilyn Monroe's centerfold from Playboy from the like the fifties, <laughs> like the first. Yeah, they wanted that, and then. We've had people want like a framed copy of the Texas Independence stuff, like you know, just yeah. they'll hide it in there to see if you. And we always if, do it just for the. That's so fun. We had to paint the zebra purple because we couldn't find a. We found a black zebra, but we, you know, a white zebra, but we had to paint it. And yeah. They just so we we go way out of our way to do that just to get, freaks them out and they have okay. fun. Do you care if that's on if that's on there? If no, we started, I, it's, it's just fun. I mean, uh, I was like, that's such a fun. Mary Chapin Carpenter wanted. Uh, one red beach towel and she wanted one copy of the new york times well no one in new braunfels has the new york times nor do they even subscribe to it except the library and so the library said well it's a sunday show and the sunday paper is going to be out in front you're welcome to come down here six o'clock and try to find it and so i did and it was gone already someone had already taken it oh my gosh so we're like oh crap you know she's going to be really pissed so she gets there and i i tell her hey we got you know the red beach towel but we don't have the and she goes is that still in there and i said yeah and she goes i i read it online i don't know why it's still in there so we have that happen a lot too where the artist never sees the writer except for you know and Mm. but we always make a point to try to find everything just it's a challenge yeah we always i mean ours is simple it's like some water some beer yeah we always make sure there's uh a lot of snacks, a lot of candy, a lot of fruit, a lot of juice, um, you know, for the healthier people. And then we always do coffee and throat coat and l- honey and lemon. Oh, and all yeah, that. that is way above and beyond. Yeah, we do all that. So. Okay, so Dale is now like, what is your official title at the Brontex? You know, I don't know. Um, I, <laughs> Which I guess is a great it's kinda, one. I used to do the booking of the bands, but then I started uh, during COVID, I started trying to retire because I got old. And so... Um, I kind of do the production backstage, the I'd say production, to handle everything that happens backstage. Cool. That's so fun because you load get to in, see all these people. Yeah, load in, load out, all the hospitality, the showrunner, um, getting the mm-hmm. bus driver to and from the hotel, getting the bands there, you know, yeah, uh, taking their food lot. orders, what they want to eat, after show food, all that. And then last time I was in there, you were setting up for a ballet. Yeah, it's a, it's a nonprofit theater, so they do uh, rentals. Uh, we have a lot of ballet companies that come in and like do the Nutcracker and right. uh, Frozen, you know, all, uh, Little Mermaid, all that kind of stuff. So, being a nonprofit, you have to kind of cater to uh, children too, because that's a big part of your grant writing is to get kids involved. Like HEB will give you a grant if you do something involving children. So, we try to do that too. We did like Puppy Pals last year. We did a bunch of dogs come in. That's why they tra- haven't given me a grant. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> I'm not made for children. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's fun. I mean, I've been, I started doing it in 2010, I guess, something mm-hmm. like that. I started volunteering there in 2003 and I became a board member in 2005. And then I got off the board in 2010 and took a full time job of booking the bands. And then, um, I was already, I was 62 right at COVID time, and I was already wanting to slow down a little bit. Yeah. And my mom had gotten real sick. She's still, you know, so uh, we hired uh, Risa Miller to come in and help me. And then COVID hit, and we didn't have nothing to do. So uh, when COVID started back, when we started back up again, we were we were closed for 15 months. Oh, my noth- gosh. Nothing. And I think we rescheduled 
maybe 30 or 40 shows three times because you didn't know how long it would last. So yeah. you'd move them back 90 days and then move them back 90 days and then move. And, and as you know, routing is a big deal. So when we moved a show, all of our routing partners had to move the show and then maybe that wouldn't fit. And so it, it was very challenging times right. for us. What's right. your favorite shows that have been there? I got to see Rodney Crowell there. Me and Paul got to see right. Rodney Crowell you know, there. It's, everybody always thinks, oh man, you have the you have the coolest job. And to be totally honest, I haven't really seen a show there yeah. uh, in a long time. Um, one of my favorite acts is, is uh, Roger Klein and the Peacemakers, yeah. and, and we got them there, and that's one of them I actually went out and sat and watched. And Sean McConnell, of course, oh. and, uh, he, his show was amazing, and uh, uh, Raul Malo comes quite often, and so I always try to make a point to go out and watch some of that. Um, Marty Stewart comes every year, and that's one I like to try to to watch. Oh, uh, yeah. But usually when they're on stage, we're we're cleaning the dressing room, we're taking out the trash, we're getting ready for them to come off stage. If they're going to go out front and do a meet and greet, we're getting the officers back there ready to take them out front. So, you know, just because the show started, we're still doing stuff. Yeah. Um, and then lately we've had to be really, we're, we're trying to be really secure there. So we're like making sure the doors are locked and we have an officer patrolling the parking lot because nowadays you just never know. You just have to be super super safe i love that because i'll leave my purse in the green room and stuff and i'm like i would rather have it on stage or something yeah, you never no. know who's going to be able right. to go back we there. make a real big point of uh, uh if they have a road manager we clear it with them like hey do you mind while you're on stage if we come in and you know clean the dressing room or if you don't we won't you know we, so nice. we and we'll lock it give them a key if they want so whatever they want it's up to them they it's their show so that's so great uh, but we it's a mostly volunteer work, so all of our backstage hospitality crew are all volunteers. So uh, they usually uh, cook homemade cookies or cake or something for them, and we. Oh, those you know, are the people that I get mad at because you can't resist a homemade right so cookie. We, you know, yeah, come on. But I, I like to. I'll probably go out and watch John Cafferty just because he hasn't ever been here to Texas, and you know uh, the show's you know not selling real well, but. Um, He's got a great band, so That's I'll go so out and watch exciting. some of that. When do you have time to write your column? Dale writes a music column, and I feel spoiled. This is the first thing. Is first things first. Thank you for. I get it two days early before <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> Not just of, me, but of course. A lot of my, a lot of my friends and out of town people. I have a lot of friends. I'm, I grew up in Victoria, so I have a lot of uh, friends and family that live out of town, and they don't subscribe to the paper. So I email it to them, and then, uh, you know, so I started just sending PDFs out, and the list just kind of kept growing and someone's like hey can you send it to me and so it, uh, it's tough you know I, I I've interviewed you before and I know how you got in the music business sometimes you get into jobs by accident you don't I always wanted to be a writer but when I was trying to write back in the 70s they weren't paying as you know about musicians sometimes people don't they want you to do it for free right everything's free you know and so when I wanted to write uh minimum wage was was two dollars and 36 cents an hour that's oh, what I, lord so when i t interviewed for this job at the victoria advocate to, to write uh it paid a dollar 70 an hour so um i couldn't afford to be a writer so i i dropped out of college and took a job at a construction company that started me at five dollars an hour so i kind of gave up on being a writer and then accidentally a friend of mine who uh delivered papers for uh in the morning throw the papers out he said hey i i saw on the bulletin board they're looking for a music writer so i i went and talked to him and and they said well we pay ten dollars a week you know and so i'm like well, okay and i didn't i never written anything about it about music i went to concerts and i'm, I'm always that kid that's had the little piece of paper writing down the set list and writing down notes and people would say who are you writing for and i wasn't writing for anyone i was just doing it for a hobby and so they gave me a chance. And this was back in the day of 1976. There was no internet. There was no, none of that. So you had to type it on a typewriter and oh physically boy. drive it to the paper and give <laughs> it to them. So uh, I wrote a lot of columns that they wouldn't publish because they were so bad. And finally in um, 77, May of 77, they, they published my first column. And uh, 
I've never missed a week since. Every week since 1977. Yep. That is incredible. Well, I take that back. I, I, when I moved to New Braunfels, I, uh, I gave up the Victoria paper job and I thought, you know, I, I'm just, I'm burned out. I've been doing it for like 25 years and every week. And, you know, like you write a song, you told me you were in a songwriting thing. You have to do, it becomes a hobby becomes work. And then you're like, damn, I don't, I'd rather do this than that. So I moved here and and gave up my job at the at the advocate in victoria and so for a week or so i didn't have a column um so i got called for jury duty and the lady sitting next to me was the editor of the herald and we were waiting to see if we were going to get picked or not and she said oh well, what do you do and i said well i work at this construction company and she said well, i work at the newspaper and i said oh i used to write for the newspaper and, oh what'd you do and i said oh i, I wrote a music column oh we're looking for someone to write a music column. Do you want to write a music column for us? And so I'm like, okay. So it start, kind of started all over again. So, oh, my gosh. That's so great. So from 94, 95, I guess it was, um, till now, I've had one every week. Write the music column. Well, I, I just got summoned again for jury duty. I've already done it. It just came again. And so maybe I'll be sitting by someone with like a million dollars who there, wants to give yeah, me like a uh, record yeah. deal for a million right. dollars and doesn't want their money back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so. trying to find that guy. That wants but I, don't, to <laughs> I don't have a, it's hard because like I, I usually try to write it every Sunday, but if I work on a Saturday, it's you know, then I only have one day off, and then and it takes a long time to write because the concert, looking to see who's playing where, that takes a long time. Yeah. A lot of venues just aren't really proactive of putting on their website or on Facebook who's playing where or what, and so it, t it takes me about eight hours to do the concert calendar, and then I'm usually every Monday morning I get up and and then write, write it as write fast as I can. Write the column. Mm -hmm. That's, that is so incredible, but it is such a good one-stop shop for where everyone's playing. Uh, yeah, and I try to, and a lot of, I wish a lot of venues um, were a little bit better at keeping their stuff. I, I mm -hmm. have to send out about 15 to 20 texts every Sunday, and then I have to send out about four or five Facebook messages and then at least a dozen emails just to get them to, to reply. To get that calendar now, you know, like Green Hall and Riley's Tavern and um, e anybody in Green, Green Grove, any of those people, you know, they're they're update all the time. But right. some of the, you know, some of the smaller venues, the music is maybe not their prime source of income. So that's kind of secondary. So they're like, oh, yeah, I need to update that. Or especially if there's a month change like this week was insane because nobody had updated to february yet right so every time there's an end of the month yeah. week i'm like oh, okay here we get go. it together that's so interesting wow there might be a whole business model for somebody out there who has some extra time that wants to do that for some venues because that yeah. would be incredible i wore all my green hall merch yeah. today yeah. i um they posted they were like we need a model for our website and you know, they're like, we'll give you a hundred dollars or whatever looking for. And I raised my hand on their comments and they, they were like, okay. Like I was kind of kidding. And then they really let me do it. So I'm like modeling. Green all the Hall green and I homage. go, my, I, I met my wife there. Um, oh. uh, we met at a Joe Ely concert. She used to book the bands at, at Green Hall. That's right. And uh, she did that for a long time. She booked the paid shows and then Tracy Ferguson books um, the free shows. And so my wife worked uh, straight for Pat Molak. She worked for him. And That's then, awesome. I mean, he did the booking, but she did, like, the contracts and got everything together and made the offers. And and I was in Victoria, and she and I had both gone through um, a divorce. And so I had to call Green Hall to get on the guest list to, to review shows. And so she was the person I had to talk to. Oh, my gosh. So we became friends uh, on the phone before we ever met. So we were friend. We were. I call her. Hey, I want to come see. You know, whoever. Uh, and she's like, Okay, I'll put you on the guest list. And so then one day I said, Well, I'm coming up to see Joe Ely. And she goes, Oh, I love Joe Ely. And I'm like, Are you going to be at the show? And she's like, You know, maybe I will. Because she had, at that point, she was like a lot of people. You get burned out of going to shows every day. You know. And she's like, Okay. And we had never met. So we met and hung out, drank some beer, and just kind of started talking and then we I think we went on a couple of dates and then we started dating and then we here we are uh 2005 we we were together in like 2000 I guess and then we got married in 2005 and 
been together ever since. So. And you guys love you guys go to concerts together. That's your mm. thing. You yeah. have been to the, some of the coolest concerts, but some of them, so many, like, how many times have you seen? 30, 32 times for Bruce. But he, he's kind of my guy, because I, yes. back in 75, everybody was, you know, you had to have an 8-track tape and vinyl back then. And so um, he was the first album I bought on 8-track tape, and none of my high school uh, friends had ever heard of him. And so... Um, I'm like, you got to hear this. You got to hear Jungle Land. You've got to hear Born to. And they're like, nah, we're listening to Skinner and BTO and Bad Company and Frampton Comes Alive and all that stuff. And I'm like, no, you've got to listen to this guy, you know. And so I, I couldn't convert my buddies. And so uh, I got to go to Austin and see him back then. And I, I've cool. seen him, I think, on every tour. I didn't, a couple of his acoustic tours I missed. And when the E Street band, he, when they got rid of them for those that one tour where he didn't have them with him, he had another band. I, I kind of didn't go to that because I was such, you know, a fan of the band too. The E Street band was like, right. They were just um, as important as I thought he was, you know. So I kind of like, eh, I'm not going to that show. But I've been and this last one in Austin, everybody's giving me a hard time about it because I, it's the first time I've ever kind of written a little bit less than glowing. Uh, reviews about it because it it was a, a phenomenal concert but it was the first time in his entire career that he quit changing the set list every night that's the thing that drew us to bruce right because you never knew what was you know back in 84 i went to rain on the scarecrow uh, tour of melon camps and i ended up seeing him in dallas houston and austin and they were three nights in a row and even the dialogue between his songs was identical it was like a snapshot of every, it was like he cut and pasted but when you went to see Bruce, you had no idea what he was going to play next. I, I mean, he that. would just play anything. And people would yell stuff out, and and he'd read the crowd. And, and if he thought he had too many slow songs, he'd, he'd throw in something. And so you might go see him in Austin and Houston, and, you, and they'd be totally different shows. Yeah, master performer for right. sure. So once I saw that, I'm like, and then everybody else wasn't doing that, you know, I Mm -hmm. Went to see Sammy Hagar one night and Bruce the next night. And it was, yeah, yeah, Hagar was amazing and, and energetic, but it was the exact same show every night. And Bruce did. And I always respected that. And, like, nowadays when an artist comes to the theater, like, let's say Neil McCoy is a good example. He doesn't use a set list. He never tells the band what he's going to play. Oh, my gosh. So I, I'm not even a musician, but I like that. That like, is very cool. That is and very I, I saw your show at Green Hall, and I love... I loved your pacing of your show. You you're really good at putting like a really fast rocker, and then you'll go. You know, you pace your show well. Bruce mm -hmm. does that. He has that ability to pace a show, and to me, that's the like, that's the model of a good artist. That you can pace a show, and you can read a crowd, and you can know, okay, this is what I need. Are you ready to take your merchandise to the next level? Well, just ask me who I use, and that is CH Lone Star Promo. They specialize in screen printing and direct-to-garment, embroidery, laser engraving, anything promo-related, they can do it. Step up your merch game now with CH Lone Star Promo and tell them Brie and Whiskey sent you. I wouldn't say I'm great at it, but I do try because there's we had one set there for a while where I just felt the whole crowd lull in the middle of it or right. something, and you you have to be able to reevaluate. You and know? you have a good band that can change. Yeah. You can turn around and say, "Hey, this," you know, and maybe put something else in. And I've been really lucky. I've had a, a lot of great band members and really good bands right now. Right. So, but so. we haven't played in a month, and we're playing on Saturday. I'm like, okay, guys, it's time to knock off the rust. Do you still remember these songs? We'll find out. Do you ever? <laughs> do you have to ever go listen to your own stuff to remember it? Uh, no, not usually. I mean, I've still been playing this whole month, so I don't really. But uh, you know, we put a Charlie Robinson song in our right. in our Which set. Which one are you doing? We, well, we've been doing New Year's Day because oh, it was yeah. like, and then I did the uh, Charlie tribute in, in Key West and Steamboat, and mm -hmm. I did New Year's Day, and um, and I and I, for some reason, I start thinking about. Well, I started in Steamboat thinking when I was singing it. This is the last time I sang with Charlie was on that stage in Steamboat. Oh wow! And I mess. I mean, I I couldn't remember the. And I had to start once I started over, and like I was like, I just need a minute to get my my life together. Right. So I mess up. I think covers more than my own stuff. I don't know. It just that's always nature. amazed me. Like even someone like Bruce or Dylan. Mm -hmm. Dylan, I've seen Dylan a few times, and you know, not to knock Dylan, but 
you can't always understand his lyrics anyway. So I think if he messes up, I wouldn't even know. But Bruce, <laughs> I know the, you know, and it always right. amaze me when an artist can remember, like, how do you remember so many words to so that just. If you start thinking about it, that's when you mess up. Yeah, I've heard like, that. I've yeah. heard you can't think. You just got to. You roll s- just yep. go as soon as you I've start heard. thinking about it but like the tribute shows are what makes me nervous i did a buffett one and then i did the reckless kelly tribute in steamboat and that was like maybe one of the most nervous i've been in my life and i missed i missed a bar chord right in front of dave abeda like the greatest one of the greatest guitar players of our time and i was like please don't i just missed one chord it was pretty fast but i was nervous you know it's just i, gotten I my was hands. surprised that reckless says they're going to quit i mean i really I mean, do you really think they are? Or are they are they. I'm hoping it's like a George Strait moment where they, they come back. Yeah. I think they're still going to do all the cool stuff. You you know, know? They did a. Uh, we were doing tribute shows at the Brontex, and and we were trying to make them fun. Like we were telling, uh, way back in 2012, we would call local bands and say, "Look, we don't want it to be a cheesy impersonation show. We just want you to come down." And, and play the songs of a band or an artist that really inspired you when you were starting out. Oh, like, and so, so we fun. had, you know, Tom Gillum did Credence and uh, Jason Eady did Merle Haggard and uh, all these different people just started. And one day Willie Braun called and said, hey, um, I'm going to I'm going to come down and do uh, Tom, Petty. Tom Petty. And yeah. I said, Willie, we can't. Uh, pay you what you want I mean they were getting you know a lot more than we were paying I think we were paying like 1500 bucks to to do a tribute show back then and we were only charging the five, five bucks at the door it was just something right. fun to do and he goes no 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 I want to do it because I want to get my band we need to practice and I want to get my band tight again because we're getting a little sloppy and man they came down and just killed it and and he even told me he said man every show after that for like six months we were spot on because we worked we worked hard at it yeah and uh i'm still trying to get him to come do a springsteen one but he he hasn't bet on that yet but i love that you you kind of have this bridge between like like you love springsteen you love that yes like but you also love the texas artist like and you also with your column you can like bridge all the different genres and eras like you you know so many people and you have met so many people and seen so many shows and it's it's just very cool well i you know, when I came from Victoria, we didn't, Victoria didn't have, uh, there's nothing harder than writing a music column when there's no music. <laughs> and COVID proved that. I mean, it was hard to write. But uh, Victoria didn't have a vibrant music scene. They just didn't. We had to rely on the on the traditional country radio station that bringing in the Tracy Lawrences and the Tracy Birds and the whatever, and Doug Stone and, and Joe Diffies. And so I could write about that when they were coming. But we didn't have clubs there that were doing music like here. Mm-hmm. So it was it was hard. So I found myself writing more about maybe one paragraph about local, one about Texas, and then one about the country, like who, a bigger star, Janet Jackson's own tour list, right? You know, whatever. But when I came here, it was like, whoa, this is, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's music here. And I came at a really good time because I came um, right when... When I came to town, KNBT was playing uh, classic country, and I, uh, my wife, uh, I needed a place to live. I was looking for an apartment, and my wife was good friends with Matson Rayner, and she said, "Hey, Matson's looking for a roommate," and I never met him. And I went to the station, and he's doing his Crossroads Americana, and he's like, "I got a room upstairs. I got a house," and he said, "I need a roommate," and I said, "Okay," and he said, "Let's go look at it," and I'm like. Uh, you're on the air right now like and he goes he flips a switch and he puts it to automatic and we get in my car and we go out to his house and it's a it's a nice home and he said I, you can have the hole upstairs so I, I was his roommate and so he had just started changing the station and playing Americana and like almost every night I'd look out my window and there'd be Charlie or Wade or Cody or someone out back and they're all hanging around out back and they've got a guitar and So I got to be there before they even were anybody. Like, they were still playing open mic nights. Oh, my gosh. How fun. uh, And then I got to see, be there when he started changing it to Americana. I was still his roommate when they got voted the number one Americana station in America when the Americana thing started. So just by being in the right place at the right time, I got to meet a lot of artists that, you know, Randy was still, I think, living uh, above the Phoenix Saloon in that little apartment. He was doing open mics at Tavern in the Green. Uh, Pat Green, uh, I'd go see him at places and no one would show up. They had no idea who he was. 
So oh. I was in the right place at the right time. You got to see it, and you got to see it grow, and and right. And now you're help, helping us. I'm, I'm well. I'm a ten year newbie, but still a newbie compared no. to the compared to those old geezers out there. Just kidding, Wade right. and Randy. I'm joking. <laughs> and now we all live here. Can you believe that this? It's a I, different town now, though. Yeah, I hear that. And they're trying. We cannot be priced out of New Braunfels. Right. It, it's um, it's it's getting really. You know, when I moved here, Common Street stopped at Green Road. It didn't go past. Oh, wow. Um, a lot more pasture land. 46 to Seguin was maybe one red light. I mean, it was. Yeah. And I know the secret's out, they say, but and everybody wants to move. You know, like Wimberley went through a growth spurt. Bernie's going through it. All of the hill country is, and I get it. Everybody wants to live here. I did, too. I mm-hmm. moved here, too. But um, I think the city maybe didn't do as well of, of letting the infrastructure keep up with the growth that it went too fast and mm. you know i it's hard to even go out for breakfast in this town you can you know, it's waiting list everywhere paul and i joke about that all the time we're like we should just open a brunch place because you cannot get yeah. in anywhere but we should should we talk when new Braunfels is terrible don't move here yeah no i'm just kidding put it's, it on the water tower yeah it's do a, not move do here. You know what I mean? well there is a billboard right here by the uh Railroad tracks and it's it's for rent and it's this tiny billboard. Have you, you seen that one? Yes. You and we it. called and a- and asked how much it was and we were like, we should just get a bunch of our friends to, to go in there. with us. Even though we moved here too yeah, right. five years so, ago, so I I can't I don't have. It's a tough call. It. I mean, it really is. It's like I, I get it. Everybody wants to live here, but it the town went it was going through some serious growing pains right yeah, now. Yeah, so. I understand. Um, who are some of the coolest people that you've met or like artists that you've met? that you love or any artist story you just have so many and it's so easy to talk to you that time has already like flown by um, um no, i don't want to over no that. no no we have a few more um, i have a couple of funny stories yeah. I, I was at walmart in victoria and they had this guy there to sign autographs and uh no one was at his table and i felt really bad and i wasn't there to see him and i was there to get something mm-hmm. for my car or something and i I walk by and it's Garth Brooks and he's sitting there and no one is coming up to see him. Oh and my gosh. <laughs> he's got a cassette there, his first album, and I felt really sorry for him. So I go over and I'm like, hey, you know, I'll buy your cassette, you know. And so I gave him $10 and I think it was like $8 and I gave him 10 and he didn't have change. I just said, you know, keep it. And so I wanted him to sign it. So he opened up the cassette and he folded all out the little insert and he goes, uh, I said, well, what's your next single? And I'd heard much too young, but he said, well, my next single is going to be the dance, and I really hope that it that it does something for me. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so he signs my cassette, and I go and shop, and I can remember this like it was yesterday. There's this lady walks by, and they didn't have water or anything for him, and he asked the Walmart lady, you know, can I have some water? And she looks at him like, who do, who are you? And so she goes she goes to the grocery aisle and gets this gallon jug of water. And just sets it down, and he, thank you, ma'am, and he peels the top and drinks it out. And so, I, uh, I just thought, man, they're being really rough on this guy. So I go and do my shopping, and I come back, and he's still sitting there. And I said, you know, he was playing down the street at the KC Hall, and I said, you know, do you need a ride? And he goes, well, I think my road manager forgot about me. He said he was supposed to take the band, and they were in a van. They didn't have a bus. They were in a van. So I said, well, man, I live. On my way home, I go right by there. Do you want to ride? And he's like, sure. And no cell phones back then. So I said, he said, well, what if we miss him? I said, no, they have to come this way to get you. So just if we see your van, we'll just stop. So on the way there, he goes, well, they probably ate dinner. And and, and I said, well, do you want something to eat? And he goes, oh, there's a Whataburger. So we go through Whataburger and we order him a cheeseburger and a Pepsi and he has no money and so he uses my ten dollars <laughs> to pay for the water burger because he said this manager had the money so i take him and and um, drop him off there and he offers to put me on the guest list and i should have gone but i didn't i only had heard that one song i didn't know yeah. so obviously the dance did well for him and he goes on and then fast forward many years and he's playing at the alamo dome and oh, that's a little jump there. So I go, I get invited, and there's a big press conference. And so there's about 15 of us in this big room, and he comes in, and he was still married to Sandy, but 
Trisha was opening for him, and you could just tell that they really were in love. Them was in love. Yes. So uh, we all get to ask a question, and it came my turn. I said, hey, I said, I know you don't remember me, but I saw you and Victoria at a Walmart, and you told me that you hoped the dance you know, would do something for you. I said, did it. And he stopped, and he goes, that guy took me to Whataburger. Oh, my gosh. And he said, and I think I owe him some money. <laughs> I thought, that's a true. That's so awesome. You're like, but, you know, you can't buy anything for $10 no. at Whataburger anymore. And the other story that's fun is I went to see, uh, I used to be friends with this country singer named Mark Colley. Oh, right. And, and I know Mark Co- I mean, I know of Mark Colley. So we, he would come to Victoria a lot. So he was playing at the amphitheater in San Antonio, and it was Mark Colley, um, Kenny Chesney and uh, Tim McGraw. So I went to see Mark and I went backstage and Mark is uh, diabetic. So we were catering to get food and there was these DJs over in the corner and they had this little girl on a stool and she was playing songs for them and she had this huge guitar and she's playing some songs. And when she finished playing, they walked by and one of them said, man, I hope somebody tells that little girl she can't sing. And it was Taylor Swift. Ah. <laughs> and I thought, we well, yeah, think about it today. Like, yeah, so, now she's ruling the world, my girl. We so, love her. Uh, those are fun. But, you know, I got to meet artists, Toby Keith, Shania Twain. A lot of those artists would come through in uh, on promotional record tours back in the 80s and 90s. And nobody knew them. Because you, you, everybody starts somewhere. Right. And... Uh, I remember seeing Kenny Chesney at a KC Hall, and maybe 80 people were there. And he had hair longer than me at the time. He had really long hair, and he put out his first record. This was in 94, and and now look at it. Before him. But, his islands. Yeah, but he wasn't doing all the islandy stuff then. Mm-hmm. He was more traditional country back then. But, mm-hmm. you know, when you – but today you could be in the right place, and, and you know people now that are coming out like – I hear people all the time saying that they kn- know Chris Stapleton from the early days of writing in Nashville. I, I did a story on Seth James the other day, and that was one of his writing partners when he went to Nashville. Was Stapleton. And, he st- and Stapleton was just a staff writer. Right. But so, yeah, unbelievable. You kind of never know who's going to do you what. You never know. So it's like, yeah, you get to meet some of these people, but it, you just were in the right place at the right time. It totally. wasn't like anything special at the time because they you didn't know if that garth brooks was going to be garth brooks, garth brooks yeah. <laughs> you know you he could have not been you know so i was eating eating uh breakfast with my old booking agent joey lee at william, william morris and he said hey that's your lawyer over there we had just gotten my sony publishing deal and i'd never met my lawyer jess rosen and so he's like well let's go meet him so we walked over there and i said hey jess and then he introduced me to the other person at the table and i was like nice to meet you and brie whatever we leave and we go sit back down and, and he was like wow you really kept your cool with kenny chesney i didn't know that the other guy <laughs> he right. was having but my lawyer was having and i was all starstruck by my lawyer and i was like right. there's kenny chesney whoops you know, whatever. But you never know. I mean, yeah. it, you don't. And those people are just people. normal people. Yeah. And they and they just either got a really good break or they were talented or, or both. And um, Luck, timing, money. I wish they were giving out record deals like they used to, but they... You know, that's an interesting thing. Interesting. There was a, uh, Gene Simmons from Kiss the other day was saying something like, um, it's hard for bands nowadays to make it because record labels treat them differently than they did back in the day. Yeah. Or you have to have, I mean, the girl that I that I was talking to recently about this, she's really great. She's a star. She already has management. She already has a record done. And then they go to the record label with, like, here's our team and here's our album. Right. It's so backwards from what it used to be, which right. was, like, take the artist. And now it's, like, the artist has to come with you with almost a complete package. Right. It's so strange. And I've, I, anyway, but I, I, we're, I really want to thank you for supporting... Sure. Texas music and all genres of music and dogs and New Braunfels in general, you're you're a gem here. And we were talking about Matson being so great for the town, and you're so great for the town. And we should continue to find ways to keep people away. From, I'm just kidding. <laughs> to keep our town right. special because right. it is so special. It is a special, especially the music scene. I've been there's not many places that I know of personally that is this strong of a music scene. I mean, you may know of some that, I, that you travel around, but. I know Memphis is pretty strong. They have a pretty good scene. I know, obviously, Nashville does. And uh, 
but for the town our size to have this many musicians here? Oh, good ones. I yeah. mean, I know places that have music all the time. I mean, I was right. just in Key West right. and everyone's playing music all the time. But to have this many, like, really, really great. good ones. Right. Yes, yeah. good singers, good yeah, places. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a difference between a musician and a good <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. So. Yes. And, oh, shout out to Moonshine Drinkery in Victoria. Have oh, you yeah. been there yet? I have not. I'm just, they bring us, they bring, they're bringing some music to the people down good. in Victoria. They're my friends there, but um, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks. We got to catch up over yeah, coffee and other Paul coffee. Paul today? Is he so he's building our house. He's our, you know, we're building our yeah, house with our own building. two hands and right. some nail guns. So he's doing that. I have a Zoom at four and then I'm going over there to work on the house till him. the sun goes down. But he's a guitar player. He shouldn't be doing stuff with his hands. I know. He was on a ladder yesterday putting a ceiling up, and I was like, I, wa- I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. I busted him being bad. We've, we're have we talking to their aide. We're trying to get them at the theater to play a show. But Wilder Blue? Yeah, but they're they're booked pretty far pretty far out. I mean, they're, they're busy right now. They're yeah. doing really well. Luke and Combs Zane cut his hand, too. Is he okay? What he, is that man doing with a gener- uh, by a generator yeah, fan? Yeah, he, he was at the Redbird, and I think they had to do a yeah. you know, to bring another guitar player with him or something. But, yeah, you know. I'm actually off next weekend, and I was like, I would play with y'all, but I only know so many chords, and that right. band knows too many chords. I can't They're do it. Great band. Well, yeah, so he'll be okay. Me. It was good news. Thanks Not for inviting me over to this. You. Is awesome. This is really cool. I, thanks. Uh, it's going well so far. I know how to empty the tanks. I know how the systems run. Yeah. I had to. I had to keep it from freezing the other night, so I stayed yeah. up all night with it. And but I, I love it so far. So thanks for being. It's cool. the podcast is only vans, but now it's only RVs. I don't know. Yeah. How'd well, you come up with that name? Obviously, only fans. So you just. Yeah, you know, I thought on. it was my idea. Like everything an artist does, that that's great. But I think it was my old tour manager, Jeff. Jeff Allen. I yeah. think it was him that did it. Well, thanks for having me. It was fun. Thanks, Dale. Fun. Yeah. You're awesome. Thanks.